Hello, this is Navigation for Glider and TMG Pilots, and this is part one of three. In the old days, we navigated using a map and a stopwatch. Uh, that was called dead reckoning. That's how I learned to fly. These days, we use GPS, but we still need to know the basics of pilotage for gliders or dead reckoning for TMGs in case we don't have GPS or it fails. So what we're going to teach in these presentations is how to use a GPS, at least the principles of it, because each GPS nav system is somewhat different in the details, how to navigate by pilotage, uh, that's reading the map and the ground and um, correlating the two to know where we are, or dead reckoning, and that's flying uh, a particular heading allowing for wind uh, and making sure that the turning points you're looking for come up on time. We're going to talk a bit about uh, the differences between navigating a glider and navigating something that's got an engine, for example a TMG, and how to deal with different levels of instrumentation. And this presentation is aimed at people doing their cross-country endorsement or SPL and those doing the TMG extension to an SPL. It's both CAA policy and BGA policy that GPS use should be encouraged and the BGA have got a, have got a sequence that we should use for any navigation uh, in a glider or a TMG. So before flight, uh, we make some preparation of the headings and the times for legs, uh, which we can cross check against the GPS and the map. And mental rules of thumb are quite adequate for that. We don't have to use the whiz wheel or circular slide rule uh, that many people will have been taught in the past. Uh, before we start a TMG, for example, uh, assuming we've got a fixed GPS in it, we put the route into the GPS and cross check it with the map and what we're expecting. We make sure we've got up-to-date airspace and also, and importantly, we make sure we've got an adequate power supply for the GPS. Before takeoff, we make sure that the indications on the equipment are correct. And whilst in flight, uh, we, without compromising the lookout, which is important, we make sensible and effective use of the GPS, um, except when we're trying to teach what happens when we don't have a GPS. And we make appropriate cross checks between the map and the prepared headings. So this is our agenda. Uh, part one of this presentation, which we're in now is on basic concepts. Part two is about navigating in a glider. And if you're just doing your cross country endorsement, you can stop there unless you wanted to look at the third one out of interest. And part three is about navigating in a TMG, which is a little different. So let's start with the basic concepts. We're going to talk a bit about pressure settings. Um, take a look at some things that you should have done if you've done your bronze exams. Uh, track versus heading, drift, compass versus GPS track, IAS and TAS, magnetic variation, and a few useful tricks. So you ought to know this stuff, but it's just a quick reminder uh, if you don't. Quite a lot of glider pilots um, seem quite happy to fly around cross country on the QFE of the airfield that uh, they took off on. And that's really not a smart thing to do. Uh, normally, we would expect people to fly using QNH when flying cross country. And that's because the air traffic service units that you talk to and you need to agree on a pressure setting um, so that you can tell them what altitude you're at. And that's generally the QNH. It's also because in certainly flying from Cambridge, almost all the airspace we see is defined uh, in terms of altitude. So by using the QNH, we can see where we are in relation to that airspace. So we need to set QNH before we go. We need to update it as we talk to different air traffic service units. It's probably not going to change very much. It won't make a big difference to our height, but at least it's a way of remembering what the current QNH is. If we're talking to military ATSUs, then they will may well give us a regional QNH. So you need to know what a regional QNH is and how it differs. If you don't know that clearly, go back and learn it and look at the bronze papers. In some parts of the country, you might use to you might need to use the standard pressure setting 1013 hectopascals if you're flying above 3,000 feet. Um, and some of the airspace in, in that case is defined in flight levels. So from Cambridge. If we go east, we've got some uh, airspace defined in flight levels just on the north, north side of the London TMA. 
Uh, and if we go west and get to Daventry, some of the higher airspace there above 6,000 feet is, is defined in flight levels. And the transition altitude uh, for most of the local flying we, we do from Cambridge is 6,000 feet. It's worth noting, if you use the Granston QFE uh, in the circuit, uh, it's worth noting it uh, before you take off, and that makes it quite easy to set it um, when you arrive back in the circuit after your cross country. Um, I tend to write it on the back of my hand. So let's look at a few basics. Um, track versus heading. And we just get a few uh, terms that we're going to be talking about later. So. We're going to point the aeroplane um, in a particular direction. That will be the heading. And that, in this case, is this brown line here. So we have a heading and an airspeed. Um, we want the true airspeed, which isn't quite the same as the indicated airspeed, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So if we fly in that direction at that speed, and we have a wind um, in this direction, then those two vectors are called, they've got a direction and a quantity. Those two vectors will add, and that will give us our ground speed and our track. That's the direction we are moving uh, across the ground. So we're pointing one way, the wind is blowing us, and we are moving the the other way and the difference between these two directions is known as our drift this is drift so it's the difference between the heading and the track and we can calculate the maximum drift and that's going to happen if the wind is uh, directly from one side and we can estimate the actual drift using a, a clock code that i'm going to show you so we don't want to do sums in the air so we'll do these before we go our maximum drift is the wind speed times 60 divided by the true airspeed, and that's all in degrees. So for TNG, which is going probably roughly at 60 knots, um, true airspeed, maybe a little more, but close enough to make the uh, to, to, to work it out. Actually, then the maximum drift in degrees is the same as the wind speed in knots. Um, so if we've got 15 knots of wind, then our maximum drift is going to be 15 degrees. At half that speed, which um, a glider might be doing on average, including the thermaling, uh, if they're not for a fairly early stage pilot, then the maximum drift is actually going to be twice the wind speed on average. So how much of that drift should we allow for a given leg? Well, we can use this clock code here. So the, the idea of this is we have a, uh, a clock face with minutes, 60, 15, 30, 45, and 15 is a quarter past the hour, 30 is a half past the hour, 45 is three quarters, and 60 is the whole thing. And if we relate these numbers in degrees, um, then we can take this much of the drift. So if the, um, the wind is 15 degrees uh, off the nose, we take a quarter of the maximum drift. At 30 degrees, it's half. At 45, it's three quarters. And if the wind is uh, 60 degrees or more off the nose, then we use all the maximum drift. And that, uh, that rule is also quite useful uh, if you are looking at a crosswind as you land. Uh, in some aircraft, we might have a compass. In other air aircraft, we might be using a GPS track. Uh, for those landing at Cambridge, GBODU's compass is pretty awful um, and won't give us a, a good heading. So we will be using a GPS uh, with a track on for navigation. So if we're using a compass, we tend to fly a heading uh, corrected for magnetic variation and we make allowance for the wind to get the track we want. If, on the other hand, we're using a, a GPS and the track indication, we don't need to take account of those two things. But our heading is still different to the track that we're reading off the GPS. So the aeroplane will be pointing in a slightly different direction to the one that we are moving in. 
there's a difference between indicated airspeed, IAS, and true airspeed. Indicated airspeed is what is shown on the ASI, the airspeed indicator. But as we go higher, and as the temperature increases, uh, the air gets thinner, and our actual speed, the true airspeed, is higher than the indicated airspeed. For most glider and TMG flights in the UK, the difference is not significant, two or three knots perhaps. But if we're flying high, uh, the difference can be quite important. So if you're in the mountains, if you're in wave, you're up at 12, 14, 15,000 feet, that can be quite a significant difference. Magnetic variation. Um, the magnetic pole isn't the same place as the actual pole. The actual pole is the center of the axis on which the Earth is spinning, but the magnetic pole is somewhere else. So magnetic north, the direction that compasses point, isn't the same as true north. And the difference is called magnetic variation. And the UK at the moment, magnetic variation is very small, but if you fly elsewhere, it might be significant. So you need to at least know about it. There's an, a useful formula, a mnemonic, uh, variation west, magnetic best, and what tells you how to uh, work out the difference. So if the variation is five west, so variation is west, then a true heading of 100 would be 105 magnetic. 105 is best, it's more than the 100. So we just add the, uh, add the variation to the true heading to get the magnetic heading. And you can see it in the diagram here. If this is magnetic north, up this way, versus true north in the vertical, then the magnetic variation is west, and the magnetic track, the difference between the aircraft track and magnetic north, is going to be more than the true track, the difference between the aircraft track and true north. A few useful tricks. The first is we can use the sun to navigate. The sun rises in the east. At noon, UTC in the UK, it's in the south and it sets in the west. So you can use your watch by pointing the hour hand uh, at the sun. South is the bisector of that and 12 o'clock. You have to make a slight correction for British summertime. Uh, you want to use where the hour hand would be if it was UTC. Or if you can do sums in the air, and many people can't, uh, you can make use of the fact that at uh, 12 UTC, the sun is at 180 degrees and every hour afterwards, it's 15 degrees more. So at three o'clock UTC, four o'clock local, it's going to be 180 plus 45 or 225, 225 degrees and 15 degrees before noon, uh, it'll be less. There's a way of estimating distance, which is quite useful. Uh, one nautical mile, as you may know, is about 6,000 feet. And if we're at 3,000 feet, then a point on the ground 45 degrees down from us is half a mile away. So we can make an estimate that way. At 30 degrees, uh, that point is a mile away. And airfields are about one nautical mile long. So if we can see an airfield, unless it's a particularly big one, um, a standard size tarmac runway is about a nautical mile. Uh, we can also generally see traffic on the major roads of a half million map. So if you're looking for a major road, it's got traffic. You can see a stream of traffic along it. It's probably a, a, a road that you're going to find on the map. 